right? Yeah, Joey Diaz and Bobby Lee tell ghost stories. This is combining two worlds. Comedy, because I do love Joey Diaz and Bobby Lee. They're both hilarious. But them telling ghost stories. So it should be interesting. Um, Because, yeah, I love ghost stuff and scary stuff. and So it should be good. Let's go. Start. You really saw ghosts? Two times. Me and Johnny Sanchez saw at the same time a ghost. Where did you see your ghost? What do you mean? It's only Where, one. No, there's only one ghost. The there's, only, room. there's only one ghost there, bro. The belly uh, room. And his name is Gus. Do you know that? Is that his name? That's his name, bro. Gus, dude. I've seen Gus twice, bro. Now, where did you see Gus? Tell the me. first time I saw Gus was Johnny Sanchez. You know that little Latino guy? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he goes, hey, bro. I go, what's up? Let's do a gig in Bakersfield. So back in the day, I used to, I had this truck with no window. The windows were blasted open. I had no money. So I parked my truck at the comedy store. He takes his car. We drive to Bakersfield. We do a show. On the way back, it's like 3 in the morning now. Right? He drops me off at my car. We're standing in the parking lot just talking about the night or whatnot. And we both look up at that top window. And we see a face glowing. No eyes, no, no, no features, wearing a top hat and two hands against the window looking down on us. And we look, we look at the thing. We look at each other again, and we look back up, it's gone. And we believe that to be Gus, my friend. That was the first time. When was the second time? I was playing the piano at four in the morning. In the main room? <laughs> yeah. Why are you laughing, dude? I haven't really heard anyone say that in before. In the main room bathroom? The... <laughs> what? How many people can say they played the, the comedy store piano at four oh, in the morning? I played it yeah, 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 yeah. in the back, that bathroom, that, that piano. Yeah, that piano back there, okay. yeah, yeah. But back then, it wasn't in back there. It was on the side of the stage. On the side of the stage. Right. So it's completely dark, right? And I'm playing with my own improvised little, you know, Korean lullaby. <laughs> you know, dang ding, dang ding, dang ding, dong, ding, dang, dang, ding, dang, dong, dong, ding, dang. You know, stuff like that. And I look to my right, and I see the a, a, a yellow suit with a top hat, but from far away. You know where the entrance is? I see it coming toward me. I run out that back door, you know, that went to the hallway. Yeah. And I come back in, it's gone. And that, that I believe that to be my second encounter with Gus. Now, I had one encounter, but it wasn't with Gus. Who was it? I think, I thought it was Sam Kennison. It's so funny that you say that, because once you say this, what you're saying, I'm going to tell you something about Sam and Gus. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, tell me what. Well, Carl LeBeau, you know Carl LeBeau? Yes, sir. Carl LeBeau and Sam Kinison were best friends. In yes. fact, when Sam Kinison died, Carl LeBeau held his body. Did you know that? As he was saying, no, it's not my time to go. Yeah, yeah, that whole All thing. That don't make me cry right now. No, I know. You know because you almost made me cry just no, now. Sad. Uh, don't sad. do that, okay? No, you almost got me there. But anyway, um, but Carl was telling me, because I got his teeth fixed. Do you know that? Back in the day when I, when I started getting, making money in showbiz, well, he came up to me and he opened his mouth and it it was like boom shakalaka in his mouth. <laughs> like death. Call the boat. No, yeah, he had opened his mouth and it's, something was rotting in his mouth. I go, what's the matter? He goes, my tooth. That's not what he sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> but he goes, my tooth. I go, what's wrong with your tooth? He goes, it's rotting. And I went and got his teeth fixed. But during that time, right, he problem. was telling me a story how when him and Sam Kennison moved here from Houston... They would, they would sleep in the main room um, on the stage. And one night, Carl and Sam were sleeping, and Carl was awoken to Sam Kinison levitating upside down from the stage. And Carl goes, what, the, what? You, know, you know how big Sam is, right? And then he was dropped on his back, but he was definitely like four feet up from the stage. And th they believed that it was Gus that d was doing that. Gus apparently was a bodyguard or a doorman back when it was Ciro's and he was assassinated there. And he's like a mafia hitman, his ghost, and he's angry. What's the matter? Why are you just staring at me like that? Princess Corey, I saw who I thought was Kennison. I was in the original room. Yeah. Okay, so I went, I was I had like a 1245 spot in the original room. It's Saturday night, this is the old days. The place is hopping. I hear a voice in the main room. There's a show going on in the main room on a Saturday night. I walk up, and it's sold out. 
I know Mitzi's in her chair in that booth there. Oh yeah, back in the day. I didn't go in. I sat in the hallway. But something, when I was looking at the comic, so the main room is that TV. The main room stage is that TV. I'm in the hallway. Something kept blocking the light from the belly room that was shining on the wall. Mm. So every time I would watch, something would block it. And I finally go, what the fuck is this? And I stepped back and I looked up. And what I saw was, what you see, dude? I don't want to say this. No, you have to. What I saw was a guy look at me, but before I could see his face or what he had in his head, he threw a cape over and he went into the belly room. That was Gus, dude. And that I ain't said, no Sam Kinison. And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. I finally saw my first ghost at the store. That's it. It's done. So <laughs> Gus wears a top hat and a cape? Now, Princess Corey has... Don't doubt it, dude. Princess Corey has oh, a story amazing. about getting fucked up at the store and going into the main room when it was dead. You know, when we first saw the day, there was no main room shows, comedy uh, chaos on Tuesday. Yeah, or it was... Skyler Stone from, on Thursday. It was from Friday and Saturday was open, but open. every night, every other night, night was, it was completely dead. dark, completely dark. closed down. Oh, Tuesday. Oh, they had Tuesday. Black Night. Black Night. Yeah, but yeah. But besides that, it was completely dead. Princess Corey told me a story one day. She was on the up and up. Her and I were eating like lunch or something. And she told me that that's the first time she told me. She goes, oh, this place is definitely fucking haunted. Hmm. And I go, what are you talking about? And she goes, one night I got really fucking hammered. And I figured I'd go into the main room and fall asleep in one of the the boots. She goes, I just wanted to. But she goes, I figured I'd nap for an hour, sleep it off, <laughs> and wake up. She goes, I was awakened to fucking ballroom music. Wow. Blasting in the comedy store. It's creepy. And she said she popped her head up, and the whole dance, the whole main room stage was people dancing with top hats and jackets on, like just dancing. And that she got like up the and ran style? out. Yeah, and set the alarm off. Whoa. Cops came, you know, the manager at the store came at the time. She was the talent coordinator at the time. This was before Freddie, I think. God rest his soul. And oh, she goes God. that the cops came, they couldn't find nothing. But I have been out in that lot many a night. Again. In those days, I was on some type of drug. Mm -hmm. So I cannot... The night I was watching the main room show, I was not on drugs. I was still had a spot, so I did not do cocaine yet. So what I saw that night, I saw. Yeah. I've seen two ghosts in my life. I saw a ghost at the comedy store, and I saw a ghost when I was about four in a building. It's funny, because the comedy store is like... I've heard talk of the comedy store. And a lot of people have had experiences um, with spirits and whatever. But I didn't know about what Bobby Lee just said about before. It was, uh, what did he say? Um, well, Mafia. No, he was a bodyguard for a hitman, Gus. And before it used to be run by the Mafia, I'm guessing. So that could explain why there's so many... Like almost like an energy trapped there, it's a dark energy. But yeah, I've heard people before, like other than these two talk about um, <clears throat> a kind of darkness that surrounds that comedy store. New York you City. remember that? Oh, four. Yes, I still remember at the comedy store, and I saw a ghost when I was about four in a building in New York you City. You remember that? Always. Four. Yes. I still remember what I felt like. I still remember telling my mother the confusion that I had. And I still remember my mother asking me the story over and over and over again like a cop to make sure I wasn't fucking crazy. Uh. And then when I moved into 3515, given that terrace, there was a time when I was, when I got out of Catholic school, I couldn't stay in that house, Bobby Lee. Yeah. I couldn't stay in that house at night. Yeah. Bobby, I'm a big boy. You know me. You know I'm the type of guy I love to be independent. When I got out of the Catholic school, when I got out of the Catholic school, my mom had a bar. Yeah. So that meant basically I had the house to myself at nights. What 12-year-old kid, what 12-year-old kid doesn't want a house to himself with cable TV? Every, every night. Every kid wants a house to himself. I would go home at night. My mother would cook dinner. I would eat dinner with her. She'd leave to the bar. I would do my homework, watch Get Christy Love, whatever show was popular in those times. Go up to my room about 10 o'clock, put the air on, go to sleep. 
and within 20 minutes, I'd be awoken by something. Bobby leave this one on for fucking a year. So I couldn't sleep. I would fucking taste toward, toward, and I would feel something. I would just, and one night I said, I can't do this no more. There's something in this fucking house. And I remember telling my mother, my stepfather, and people, they're like, you're crazy, you're watching too many horror movies. And I fucking started living with a family. I would just go to the house at night. I played basketball with the kids, and the parents didn't have a fucking clue who was in their couch at night. So you just you couldn't sleep? I would go to my mother's bar, stay at my mother's bar till nine, do homework, eat dinner with my mother, and then go to 26th Street in Central. They were a Puerto Rican family named the Torreses, and I was some of Jose Torres, Papo. And I'd go to his room, we'd watch TV, and nobody would know I was even sleeping in his house. I'd get up in the morning, brush my teeth, comb my hair, and go to North Bergen School. So mm -hmm. I would stay in Union City and go to school in North Bergen. The fucking point of the story is yeah. that after my mother died, and I found the dead and the whole thing, I found out an interesting fucking story. Some people came over after my mom died, and they said, we're really sorry about your mom's death. And they said, you know what? We never liked this house anyway. We thought about buying this house. But you know why this house sold for cheap? Because somebody hung themselves in the garage. Whoa. And right there, yeah. I knew that all my... That's another thing that um, I've seen. If something like that has happened in a house that they have to tell you. Um, legally, I think. Premonitions that I had. I would hear it, Bobby Lee. I'm not a retard. I'm not a fucking idiot, Bobby Lee. I know what I see, and I know what I feel. I would feel somebody going up the steps. Wow. That's what I would feel. People running up the steps and running down the steps. Now, the person that killed himself, was they, were they white? I had no idea. You have to know that shit. You have to know that shit. Probably New Jersey, you would think so, right? I thought he hung himself. For years, I heard the room. Because after, like, my mother died. They buried her. And these people who had lived on the block, I knew... Like, I wasn't friendly with them. Yeah. They came that day and were like, we looked at this house first. It was like $10,000 cheaper. <laughs> yeah. But somebody killed themselves in the garage. So yeah. uh, they said that he hung himself. And then I told somebody, and they came back to me. They go, well, now nah, we did some looking. The guy was one of those guys that uh, closed the garage. Ooh. They put mm. the fucking the thing car in. The car on. The car on. So anytime I go back to that house, like when Lee and I shot the documentary, I could feel that house like i was thinking about buying that house but there's st thinking, it's still there i'm buying that house I'm it's thinking, still there yeah it's still there and i'm yeah. thinking of going back to north bergen and saying what do you want for this house and offering them twenty thousand dollars more gutting that house gutting it from a to z gutting it cleaning out the outside i know there's shit in the yard I know there's weapons hidden in the yard from my stepdad you think they're still there i know they're still there yeah I hit a gun in 85th Street. I know it's still there. Whenever I talk to the people, I go, did you motherfuckers ever find that gun? They're like, where did you put it? Yeah. I said, by the garage. It had to be like three feet in. But there's something about 3515 given that terrace that's always bothered me. Still till today. Wow. My mother died there. I found her in the kitchen. You know, what that house had become. Well, who lives there now? A family, when me and Lee were there. An older Hispanic family, right? An older family, but they had had it since Who's my Lee? mother died. Lee. His name uh, is nice Lee. Nice to meet you. That's Bob. That's oh, Lee. that's the you are Lee, huh? Yes. That's, that's my bad, dude. No worries. I think you thought, you thought his name was Jimmy? I don't remember, but I, I the whole time I was thinking, what the fuck's this guy's name again? Yeah, so yeah, when yeah. Lee and I hey, went. Hey, Lee, what's up? Nice to see you, Good buddy. See you, when man. Lee and I went and shot the documentary, yeah. some people came and they go, no, I think the people bought that house when your mother died. They, like, they were the first people that bought it, yeah. and they still live there. But I would like to buy that house and... There's nothing you can do, though. Tear it down. No, no but even if you build something back up in there, that the ghost is still there. No, no. I could do something. You could bring, like, Indian chiefs. <laughs> and fuck. And you can give it a oh, try. Oh, yeah. Have the people dance on it and shit. I know my mother's in that house. I know my mother's tormented in that house. I know that she's in there. I would give her peace of mind. I've always thought about that. And I can't believe how cheap the prop might. Like, my friend's dad died. He's got a two-floor fucking house in North Bergen. It's four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, North Bergen is a throw rock from New York City. Is it still safe? The house, the neighborhood is safe. Everything's safe. You would have to tear the house down 
and build a new house, but what, the property. Yeah, communicating with the dead and stuff. Now you're getting into stuff. No, 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 no. Do I, no, do I say I want to communicate with nobody? Listen, you're talking about the wrong dude. No, but you, you wanna, you, wanna, you wanna, what, what do you wanna I do? Would, I would like to buy that house. That house meant a lot to me. Probably. I know, but the thing is, is this is that no matter what you do with the house, you tear it down, you wipe it out, you build something else on there. The spirits are still there. You believe that? Yeah. Okay. It's yeah, not in the there's... wall. It's not. There's a um. There's a book about London where it talks about the character of cities and it, they talk about London and the character in different parts of the like as if cities have, like certain parts of cities have their own, um, yeah, personality. And there's a place in London, I, I don't know if it's still called Gin Alley, and I'm pretty sure now it's got a, a beer um, factory, like where, yeah, where they make a, a distillery, I guess it's called, isn't it? A beer distillery, where they make beer. I'm sure, I don't know if it's just called Gin Alley now or it was back in the day, but if you look at that Pacific part of London where that is, it's always been a place like this crack, or maybe it's not the beer distillery now, but it, it's. It's basically where people will go and get crack. And if you go back and back and back, that part of London has always been a kind of, yeah, a drug, alcohol, um, just always had kind of, what's the word? Um, low lives, we say. It's been an area that attracts low lives. Even to this day, there's a. I'm not sure if today it's a crack. A crack area. Or, a, yeah. A beer distillery. But it's like. So I think Bobby Lee's actually right that there is a kind of. And then it, the energies get trapped and it. And it yeah. I think Bobby's right. I don't know. I don't know whether I believe in ghosts, but I do believe in energy, and that there are energy, like whether it, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I believe, but yeah, that's good. In the concrete, what makes you believe that? Just, just I'm not because doubting it's, you. Because I'm it, not arguing with you. I'm because just we're, know. we're dealing with a different plane, my friend. Okay, they're they're they're, they're on both planes, right? So you have to just, you have to go to the second plane. Take some sort of machine. Maybe Duncan Trussell knows about one. No, no, which Cuban? The Cubans call El Mundo de la Verdad. Get that. That they went get over get the to El the Mundo. world of, of truth. Yeah. I understand that. But I figured whatever was haunting me. Listen, Bobby Lee, I had a, you've been addicted to drugs. You've been addicted to drugs right. where you started hearing things. That's right. I've been addicted to drugs where I started hearing things for 27 years. You know, it's a mental prison. That's the easiest way to describe an addiction. People who are going through opioids or whatever you're going through, my heart goes out to you. And you know I love you. You know I'm telling you the truth, that it's a mental prison. You can't be reliable. You're not reliable no more. You and I both know it's a mental prison. But uh, I, I still believe in the spirituality of life. I, I do too. You know, what? like when I did The Longest Yard, where we shot the longest yard in New Mexico, yeah. there was a riot at that prison, and they killed seven guards, and they shut the power down, and when they turned the power on, people thought that it was water, it was blood, it was a stream of blood from all the people they had killed. Mm. Until this day, they took the blood out, and they paint the floor every year, but there was so much blood on the floor that the blood, the blood still comes up from the prison What the floor. fuck are you telling me this about? Because <laughs> when we shot the longest yard there, they found out about that, that Paramount did. So Paramount didn't want no fucking problems. So they sent a Swami, a Hindu, a Catholic priest. I think I'm kidding you. An Ooh, Indian no priestess. Everyone for every everybody religion. Everybody for every movie. religion. And they sent them down there to do a cleanse. The funny thing was the producers wanted to make sure. So they offered anybody who spent the night in the prison. Yeah. A thousand bucks. And the fucking, nobody spent the night. Everybody would uh, run out an hour in because they heard noises and but shit like that. But you know Mitzi, though, right? right. Mitzi hired an, a, a cleaner from Paris every year for like 30 years to clean her office. Because there was a, apparently like things would levitate and crash against the walls in her office. Have you ever been inside her office? Yes. I've never seen it. 
and I've been there for 25 years. I don't You've think you've ever allowed. seen the inside of that office. No. Yes. You've seen the inside. The inside of that office. I thought that. I thought well, no. She one was seen alive. It. This was 15 years ago when she used to come in three times a week. Yeah, I never saw. I was inside. a telemarketer upstairs with but they clean, But they, but they, she would clean it every year, and they would. St- she would say it still wouldn't be clean. No one could clean it. So what I'm saying is, is that who knows if these thing, these Hindus and these like, you know, cleaners can do anything. Well, here's the deal. I was at the store one afternoon. I used to do Bob Oshak's job, who before that was Freddie Soto's job. And what you did was you basically fucking drove. You went to get her a tongue sandwich. You went to the hardware store and you made deposits at the bank. <laughs> yeah. That was your job, right. you know? And you picked up shift a little Mexican carpenter. Is he still there? Yeah. The yeah, yeah, yeah. I love him. Love him. He's, he's gotten, he, but he's doing well in life, so he's a little fatter. Is he? He has, <laughs> she has more he's, cheeks. I got to go see him. And he was like, hey, bro, how you doing? Yeah, he would be down there 10 after 9. Yeah, I like that guy. Shit. I forgot his name. What's his name? I, Emilio. Yeah, whatever. Emilio. whatever. I was there one day <laughs> waiting to go on a mission. And the weirdest thing happened. A van pulled up, like a handicapped van. You know, it had to be 19, had to be 2000, 2001, maybe. It's got to be 2 in the afternoon. And this van pulls up. Guy gets out of the car, kind of looks like me, a little thinner. And he opens up the two doors and he puts a wheelchair guy in the ramp and he presses a button and the ramp pushes it out. And the, and the guy walks up and uh, he's very friendly, the guy. He goes, how you doing? And I go, how you doing? If I was uh, 40, 38 at the time, the guy had to be 80, yeah. 85. And his handler was about 40, 45. And they were very nice. But the guy asked me blatantly, he goes, is Mitzi here? And I go, I don't know. You know, I don't know nothing. You know me, I don't know nothing. I don't know if Mitzi's here. And he goes, she goes, are you a comedian here? And I go, yeah, I'm trying, you know. Yeah. I'm trying to put the pieces together, sir. <laughs> and I didn't know what the guy did. But he goes, I was one of the original doormen here when it was zeros. Whoa. Did Mitzi ever find the money? Do you know she ever found the money downstairs? Whoa. And I was like, I have no fucking idea. And then the guy rolled by me, and I don't know if he saw Mitzi. Whoa, wait, wait, wait. What if you're saying to me right Mitzi. now is in the basement. In the basement. There could be money stashed away there. Yes. Because you know they, they, you can get down there now. People hang out yes, down there. They have a we got to find it. Yes, but I heard that this, I heard that you could go downstairs and sneak out all the way to the street behind it. No. Yes. That, that's the There's way, a tunnel. There's a tunnel because. No. Yes, because the guy who owns Ciro's. Smuggled shit. What's his name? Ciro. No. The guy who owns Ciro <laughs> was a gangster. Uh uh-uh. That kid, Bugsy Siegel. Oh, uh, Bugsy Siegel. Bugsy Siegel was who created Las Vegas. With yeah, the I know who Bugsy Siegel when is. When he came out to Vegas, they thought he was rubbing shoulders with the wrong people. He was getting a little, a little fucking smoochy, and he was dating a Hollywood starlet, and plus, the envelopes were a little light in Las Vegas. The math didn't add up. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I gave you $8 million, but I got $6 million in contractor retreats. Meanwhile, you're in L.A. having dinner with fucking Sinatra. And I'm over <laughs> here in Buffalo eating meatball sandwiches <laughs> with a Korean and a fat little fucking Jew that's on a diet. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Lee. <laughs> so Lee. Yeah, yeah. What's it say? Who owns Ciro? Oh, I thought you... I, I thought no, you were... I think it was Bugsy Siegel who owned oh, Ciro's oh. originally. So they would kill people there. That's what I'm saying. They would kill people yeah. there. And that's the result of it. People got tortured there yeah they had a room down there where they would torture people plus and had, in the belly room too was an illegal abortion center did you know that no yeah there was an illegal abortion center and that's why they call it the belly room jeez jesus christ and that's why at times at people have said this if they do you spend the night there you can hear babies crying upstairs but can i just tell you something about that belly room also and yeah. this, it brings up something the scariest thing i've ever seen up there one night at two in the morning, I was hanging out there, okay? And they go, Don't, you know, you can hang out here, but upstairs they're doing something, but you cannot go up there in the belly room. I go, it's closed. Who gives a fuck? He's like, there's something going up there. Do not go up there. But I went up there. You know, the back <laughs> entrance, up the black. I opened up that back thing, right? All that, It's pitch black in there, but I see candles, right? I swear to God, I saw this. 15 people wearing hoods. And purple cloaks. Oh my god. Okay. 
and they're chanting. Right? And then, so I go back downstairs and I wait to see. They come down after the, the seance. You know who I saw? One of them was Lily Tomlin. Okay? The second one was Bob Zamuda. You know Bob Zamuda? And they were seancing Andy Kaufman's ghost. Did it work? I, I don't know. I, didn't, I, I didn't stay <laughs> up there long enough to know. But what I'm saying is, is that there's something about that belly room that is a portal of something. Why are you laughing? <laughs> it's just crazy. It's a comedy club and it's it's like a haunted house. Almost. <laughs> I still remember yeah, yeah. living in 3515, being a child, not a child, being a teenager, and staying in on Friday nights to watch Sanford and Son. And there was, used to be a show called Ripley's Believe It or Not. Oh, yeah. yeah. Go to you first. Find out who owns Zero. So yeah, it was <laughs> Bugsy Siegel was the last one to own it. He wrestled it away from the. There we the go. So Bugsy Siegel. Previous owner was there. Was there ever a Zero open uh, that owned it? Uh, no, the first yeah, owner was William Wilkerson. But his nickname was Zero, though. I bet. But the people who rented it after he did went to Mitch, went to Sammy Shaw, and said if he wanted to start a. Now what was the second one? The second owner. What was the second thing I needed you to do? Uh, I think maybe Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yeah, go to YouTube and see if you find but Ripley's is, Believe but, It or but Not. But before you get into story. that, I want to just say a, a, a last, the last point I wanted to make, which is, is there is something dark about the store. It's not because it's black. There's just something a weird vibe there. A lot of comics, even though we're having an upswing, there's this girl who she's she has an... I'm not going to name her name because I want to get in trouble, but she has a Netflix special. But she doesn't play the store. And I was at the Laugh Factory and I saw her perform. And she got off stage. I was right after her. And I never met her before. She's very funny. And I said, You're very funny. And she goes like this. She goes, Kuh. And she just walks away from me. Right? Which is rude, right? So in my head, I'm thinking maybe it's in my head. And then check it out. The next week, I'm at the improv and she's sitting there because she's about to go up. I sit next to her. She walks up and walks away. So I did some investigating, and I go, this girl, you know, she she avoids me. I, I've never met her before. I never talked shit behind her back. And a bunch of comics were saying, oh, yeah, she, anyone that works at the comedy store, she won't even talk to. I go, why? Because she th believes that every, we're all, like, kind of like demons and that we're all, like, a part of this weird comedy cult, that we're dark. We have dark energy. Yeah, that's crazy though. I've heard so much about people tell it with different stories like that of the comedy stuff. Maybe that wouldn't be a bad thing to look into as well. See if there's a thing of a video about that. Because I've I've heard that, and and that woman saying that, I think Patrice even says something about it. Didn't he say something about evil spirits in the? Comedy store. But yeah, that was good though. Bobby Lee's just so funny too. But it was good because you have good them too. Like, I love both of them. <clears throat> and I wouldn't think Joey Diaz to be into spirits like that, to be fair. But yeah. But Bobby Lee, I think he's, he's one of the funniest people ever. He's just ability to make things funny. Why are you laughing? <laughs> this is great when he does that. But yeah, that's weird. I've heard people talk about the comedy store and, and there's, there's, just, there's a darkness around it. But then saying that, I remember uh, if anyone knows hip hop, Method Man. I saw him ask about Tupac and he talks about seeing Tupac in a club. And he said the similar thing about Tupac. I don't know what it was, but there was just a darkness there's like a dark aura around Tupac like and I could just feel it off of him there was just this darkness and yeah yeah but it's funny about the steps because that's one of my ghost stories I have which I've told my ghost stories on here um, but one of them was me lying in bed and in my mum's house 
cars in a little room at the top of the stairs. You come up the top of the stairs, turn a bit, like literally three steps on the turn. And my room was right there. Like the door frame of my door met the banister of the stairs. It's right there. And I was a kid, so I sat with my door open because I was really scared and that. Um, and our top step made a very distinctive noise when it was stepped on. You knew it was that step. And I heard someone come up the stairs one night. And that step went. But no one walked out. I was waiting for someone to walk onto the landing. Um, and no one did. And then I, I remember it. But like, as a kid, now I was a kid in that room. So I'm eight maybe. And I heard that top step go. And I thought in my head it would be me... My dad, my mum and my sister that lived there at that time. My two older sisters weren't there. So in my head, I'm thinking it's either my dad or my mum, uh, not my mum, my sister, going to make me jump. I know it wouldn't be my mum. My mum is, yeah, she's just not like that. But I heard that top step go and I, and I, I was thinking they're like hiding on the other side of the wall, going to make me jump. So really slowly, I crept out of the cabin bed, so I was raised up above. And ever so quietly, I snuck down, because I was thinking, I oh, know, I'll scare you, motherfuckers. And I snuck to the end of the bed, stuck my head around the door, and there was no one on the stairs. And I still remember that. I remember that clear as day happening. And just starting up the other end of my bed and laying down. I don't even think I called for anyone. So it's funny the stairs thing. Because I've got a, a, a story of... But yeah, that was great. That was great to watch. But yeah, let me know your thoughts. That's the reaction. Sweet.